everybody, thanks for joining me today. In this tutorial we're going to have a look at a very simple geometry node setup, which you can use for motion graphics, backgrounds and even video transitions, like I did in the intro. Specifically we're going to make this example right here. If you're not really familiar with geometry nodes or dislike the node-based workflow, don't you worry, uh, it is a really easy example and I will explain each step along the way. So let's get started. First up, we have to create a simple shape that we can instance later on. So in our case, we are going to use a simple rectangle shape, which we just create from default cube. And we're just scaling down here, oops, on the X and Y axis a little bit to get something like this. Then we press Ctrl A to apply the scale. And then we select the edges right here. And then we're going to bevel them. And in here we are going to enable clamp overlap and I think maybe let's use 15, yeah, uh, 15 segments, that looks good. And now we are going to select all with A, press M for the merge function and we merge by distance. And now we removed four vertices. So now we can select these faces right here and with control B, bevel, and we can create nice round corners. Uh, 15 is a little bit too much here. Let's say 10. And now set shades move and we're finished. Now, don't forget to always rename your objects if you use them. Like this one here is rectangle round. And we're finished and we can put it off to the side. Now, before going into the node editor, Let's briefly talk about what the main goal actually is and how we can achieve it. We want to instance our object, which we just created, multiple times on a mesh in a grid pattern. To do this, we will transform a basic grid into a lot of points. And on these points, we will then instance the round rectangle. These instances can then be rotated and moved along each axis individually with the help of a texture or the proximity of other objects. So here in Blender, we're going to create so on any object, in this case a plane, and we go over here to the Geometry Nodes tab and we're going to create a new Geometry Nodes uh, tree. In the first step first, we're going to delete the input and get a grid primitive. Uh, fun fact, if you didn't know, if you're searching for any node, you can just press Shift A and then hit S and then you can type whatever you are searching for. And this is the way I get my nodes uh, most of the time. So yeah, we have a grid node and we connect it to the output and we see we have a grid. Um, the reason why we using a grid node and we are we're deleting the first plane uh, in the first place is that we have a lot more options here and we can change them later on. And this is a much more flexible workflow in our case. So now let's use a transform geometry node and transform this grid by uh, 0 0.5 in the z-axis and rotate it on 90 degrees in the y-axis so it stands upright. And now if we take a mesh to points node, we can see that this node transforms our geometry into a lot of points and we have different options here. For this case we have here vertices, edges, faces and corners. In this case I would like to have my points centered on each face so I'm going to select faces and when I come back here to the grid option we can see if I change now the amount of vertices in our grid that the mesh is then automatically uh, generating more faces of course and this, uh, because of this we are, go we are getting more points in our mesh. Now we are going to Let's say make 10, 10 vertices, looks good. And in the next step, we're searching for a node which is called instant on points. And with this node, we can instance the geometry we created before uh, onto these points here. Uh, always good tip to pin this node group so that we can get here the round rectangle from before and drag it into our scene, into our node tree. And now we're going to use this geometry here as the input for our instance. And what we can see is that we have a big mess. This is because we have to first apply proper scale to each individual instance. 
So I'm going to shrink this down to something like 0 0.1. Can be a little bit bigger, 0 0.11, yeah. Almost touching each other. But now I also want a second row of instances to fill these gaps in here. And one way of how we can achieve this is if we make a little bit space down here and we're going to use a second mesh to points node. We can just copy it with Shift D. And then here, instead of setting faces, we're going to apply vertices. And now if we take the same geometry from before and look at the points here, we can see that it's basically doing the thing that we want it to do, but we only get one part of the points. So we use Shift A and S, A, join geometry node where we're going to join these two points point groups together so we get um, both points in one object and you can see that this is basically what we were going for but now we have the problem that if i were to rotate all these meshes or these instances that these would uh, intersect with each other so a way to fix these and what I did is that we're going to copy this transform geometry node and we're going to clear all the values we generated and then we are going to use it as a transform for the second mesh to points with the vertices and we're going to translate it on the x-axis by just a little bit by 0.1 and now we see that we have a little bit of offset this is even more than I intended to to be honest Let's get it back a little bit more. Yeah, something like this, 0 0.005, 0 0.05, yeah, perfect. And now if we rotate them in any direction, they should not or most certainly will not intersect with each other. So the hardest part is almost done. Now let's introduce two new nodes, which are called uh, translate instances and the rotate instances node. Like the names imply, the first one is for translating its uh, each individual instance. And the second one here is for rotating each instance. Uh, we start off with the translate node first. And I always like to play around with noise textures too for translating or rotating because they give really cool images and they just look basically really cool. And what we can do here is instead of this 3D, we can put it into 4D, four dimensions. And this W value here basically is a time offset. And when you click in here and type hashtag frame, this value will be automatically updated uh, based on the values from our timeline. So we, if, if I hit play, we can see that it automatically updates to the to the frame in the timeline. This can be sometimes a little bit too fast. This is why we're going here and divide it by, let's say 50. So we have a much more smoother motion. And what we're going to do now is we're using a combine XYZ node. And this node helps us to create a vector from three different inputs. And we will take our the output, the vector output of our noise texture and put it into, let's say the X axis here and leave the other two values at zero and then we use this vector here for the translation and what we can see is that something is already happening but not really much this is due to two reasons first up the scale is a little bit too high we can decrease it like to 0 0.5 even and see that hmm, not a lot is happening and that's because uh, the noise texture is basically outputting a value between 0 and 1. And a value between 0 and 1 is not really much if we want to translate our objects. So what we can do is we can use a map range node here. And so we're giving it a value between 0 and 1. So this is what has been uh, declared in the first two from min from max is 0 and 1 and we want to push these uh, to a new maximum so we let the minimum at 0 and we want to push it to a new maximum of let's say 3 and or even higher we can say 5 
and now we can see that a lot more is happening but it's still moving the whole mesh and I think it's because I have a little bit too a too low scale so let's say like 2.5 and we can see that now the mesh is really being transformed if we want to increase the contrast between uh, this for this effect what we can do is we can introduce a color ramp after the noise texture and we can play around with the with the sliders here to increase the contrast and see that if we now hit play we have our instances moving along the x-axis we of course can also uh, use it in the y direction which also is a really cool effect and we can also use them in the set, set direction of course which will move them upward and you of course can also combine these on two vectors, uh, two axes at the same time, or even all three, if you would like to. And this is basically moving your instances along a along axis. And now we can look at rotating our instances, which is nearly much, uh, nearly identical. So I'm unplugging this uh, node input here from the translation, and I'm giving it to the rotation here. And we can see that already a lot is happening and normally I would say we do, we do not like to just play with a few degrees, like five degrees, but the mesh is already rotating a lot. And if you want to have more control over it, let's say we want to have the mesh or the instances uh, to say, we want to rotate at a maximum of 180 degrees. But the problem with this is that the input up here for the rotation only takes radians and not degrees. So we can use a math node in here and in the conversion section down here we can find a tool which is called two radians a function and this will rotate uh, will calculate the right rotation for our mesh for our values down here so if you play we can see that our mesh is turning at a maximum of 180 degrees we can always also limit it to 90 and play around with these values as well and again it's working in each direction, uh, X, Y, and Z, or like, like before, we can also combine these if we want to, which looks a little bit silly right now. <laughs> so yeah, perfect. Um, with this setup, now we can also, instead of using a noise texture, I am just, I'm just quickly unplugging this, we can also use a geometry a proximity node to use an outside geometry as the drive object for our mesh here. And what I have done before is I used a text object and I deleted the text inside and set a number like let's say five. And then I'm going to rotate it um, so that it's upright and visible. And then I'm going to scale it up a little bit more and position it here. And now if we take the text here and import it as, uh, the same way as we did before, and then we take the geometry output as the input for the target in our geometry proximity, we have to keep in mind also that we have to put the position to relative. And now we are using the distance output of the geometry proximity node as the input for our color ramp. Now, if we want to visualize this, we can always press Control shift and left click on an object to preview its values. And if we're going to preview the distance here, we can see that we first of all need a geometry input up here. And we, if we would look at the instances, we would see that nothing really much is happening and they all look kind of gray. And this is because uh, each instance is handled as an own object where the proximity is applied. But what we want to have a look at is actually the mesh we transformed in the beginning. So we can see what's actually happening with the proximity here. And we can see, ah, yes, everywhere where the five is, there is now a black value, which means in our case zero, and everywhere else is a gradient up to white, which is basically one. So we can, and we will turn this around, and we can see if we take this value right here now, Perfect, that if we move this a little bit closer, that now everywhere the five is, um, 
there is a value of one and everywhere else is a value of zero. If you want to increase this resolution of the proximity of the distance gradient we get, we have to increase the resolution of our mesh. So we would have to increase like to 20 or to 30 or 50. Now, then you would have to change uh, the scale of your instances and so on and so forth. But for this case, I will leave it at 10. And now if we disable this again, we can see that only, and if I disable this here, we can, only, we can see that only where the five is, uh, our mesh is being uh, transformed. And now you can also use your mesh and animate it and see that the mesh is basically reacting to your, your numbers or text or any object you want to have. Just be sure at the last, as a last step that you use a set material node and select a material so you can shade your instances right here. And a quick tip for shading. In the shader editor, when we select our object and the material, we can use a, an object info node and use the random output down here. And if we look at it, we see that each value uh, that, and we see that each instance gets its own value, its, its own number, so to say. And now what we can do is we can take a color ramp and put it here. And then let's say we make a couple of stops and with this drop down menu here, we can distribute them stops, those stops evenly. This is one too much for my taste. And now we can also change the interpolation to constant. And what I always like to do now is to use a website called Coolors. Uh, and this website has a lot of tools for uh, basically generating different color patterns. And if you find something that you like, you can preview the hex codes of each color. And I would like to use this one here. I would like to use these four colors. And you just click copy for the color. And then you can apply this color in Blender to the hex code. And we can do this very quickly here. And now we have a very colorful and nice looking instances on our mesh. And this is how I got the colors on my mesh for the introduction video. Well, this is basically it. From here on out, you can try different shapes, settings and textures or different objects to create your own animations. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and found it useful. If you want to see more Blender and 3D content, be sure to subscribe and leave a comment what you want to see next. And also be sure to check out my other videos and I will see you in the next one.